So I'm just going to quickly introduce um, Jesse Moore, who is our first speaker. Um, Jesse is uh, a member of the RDH team in Toronto. Um, he's a building scientist and an engineer um, who works on a bunch of different projects, but particularly kind of more interesting stuff, um, including tall wood and I think tall buildings generally is an interest. <laughs> yeah. So I'll let him um, speak for himself and introduce his talk. Thank you. Tonight we're going to be talking about tall wood and specifically how moisture affects tall wood buildings. As Melissa mentioned, I'm Jesse. I work in RDH's Toronto office. Um, I'm a bit different than uh, some of the other RDHers you see out here. I'm originally from Vancouver um, and I've been in Ontario for the last three years. I've got a few photos up there and those are a few of the buildings I've assisted uh, architects with over the last three years. So uh, they tend to be a lot of university buildings or stuff that's uh, unique. One of the reasons I really like working on tall wood buildings uh, is a lot of the sports I do uh, and the, the hobbies I enjoy doing are out in the forest, out in the woods. And it really that experience you get from being in a tall wood or a mass timber building kind of reminds me of that. So what I have for you tonight, uh, the first couple sections are going to be a bit of a, a background and primer, um, basically on what we know about wood, what we know about moisture, mm -hmm. the type of projects we're seeing being built out of tall wood in the last couple of years. And then we're going to get really into um, the crux of uh, the presentation of how to control moisture when you're, you're building these types of buildings. So this was one of the, the first taller wood buildings. Uh, this was built about six or seven years ago. <clears throat> and this is in Prince George, BC. The first two floors were uh, cast in place concrete. And then above that, uh, the structure and all the flooring is all built out of CLT. They actually had a, a very unique curtain wall system um, that incorporates wood mullions as well. Um, but as you can see, the, the form of this building, uh, relatively boxy. Next sort of step up was, uh, this is a UBC um, Tallwood Residence Building. So this took a, a significant leap in height. Uh, this basically went to 17 stories. Um, but again, a, a fairly uh, boxy facade, um, nothing too unique. So now I'm going to show you two more that are, are upcoming. This is uh, U of T's proposed tall wood tower. Um, as you can see, we're doing a little more um, in terms of complexity. The, the shape varies a bit. It's also integrating with an existing building. So the, the level of complexity is going up. Um, this one is 16 stories, uh, slightly taller than the, uh, the UBC one because the floor to floor height is bigger. And uh, lastly, in the last couple months, uh, this one, they started putting out renderings. This is a proposed building in Vancouver. Uh, this is 30 stories. And as you can see, the, it's taller and the, the form is actually quite unique to it as well. So what we know about wood and moisture, um, being from the West Coast, uh, a lot of my work when I was out there was related to the leaky condo crisis. And for anyone unfamiliar with that, we built a lot of buildings um, that looked like this, uh, usually three to four stories, built out of stucco, um, very poor water management details, which resulted in a lot of uh, deterioration. So it's quite common to see stuff like this, like we're getting very wet during construction. Um, I've got a few notes up there basically saying, you know, there's different ways that we can, that the structure of the wood can get wet. So um, obviously through poor manage water management details, which is an operation thing, also like sealed in moisture from the construction. And we saw a lot of this in, in the 90s in Vancouver. So when they, uh, when they started having issues and water leakage, once you start opening up the wall, water that's sealed in there is uh, deteriorating um, the framing, the sheathing. Uh, and it was fairly calm to see stuff like this. Our Vancouver office does a ton of work where they're basically fixing uh, condos that have leaked. So they've, they've done a bit of a study and best practice guide um, looking at, okay, how wet can wood get? 
obviously wood when it's pulled out of the forest has a moisture to it. If it's prolonged um, being wetted for a prolonged period and can't dry out, you'll basically get to a point where um, mold spores will form or decay will occur. Um, and that generally is around the mid 20s in, in terms of moisture content. This is a rather complicated graph, but it basically shows that when you are pulling, um, cutting down trees, you are at a fairly high moisture content. You might go to, you cut your boards, they're dried in a factory, they go down to a lower moisture content. And then as you're, um, as you install it in the building, uh, you, you kind of have a range that's safe and the, and the building might fluctuate um, depending what the, the exterior conditions are, what the interior conditions are. And if you're playing in that range, um, everything works out kind of well. Once you, you get back to wetter moisture contents and points where it can't dry, um, that's when you started to see some of the photos we saw earlier. So now I'm gonna jump into um, taller wood buildings and, and how to manage some of that moisture we saw earlier. So for taller wood buildings, um, especially in Ontario, we really have multiple ways that this can be wet, like wetted during construction. Um, on the west coast, they tend to only think about rainfall events, um, but here we also get snow. We also, for, for instance, on one of the projects I was working on, there was snow that was building up uh, all over winter, and then it got to be one point in uh, late March where, where all of a sudden we saw warmer temperatures and all the snow that was on the project um, was potentially going to wet, uh, melt and wet the wood frame. So just different ways we can manage this. This, is, um, this was kind of an impromptu method where uh, they realized the wood structure was getting quite wet. So you can see they've gone out to uh, Home Depot or whatever and bought kiddie pools to try and collect the water. <laughs> Toys R Us as well. Um, and you can also see that they've basically like routed temporary um, hoses through all the operable windows to try and get that water out of the building. So that was kind of uh, something they did on the fly to try and make that work. Other projects are more proactive. So for instance, um, this is out of Europe where they've basically totally wanted to avoid that risk and they've paid for uh, you know, scaffolding, uh, tarping to keep their entire project dry. This can be quite expensive, but it also saves you a lot of risk during the project. Um, they actually made the scaffolding so it spanned the entire roof so you could work on that uninterruptedly. And some of the other things you might want to think about during construction, um, for instance, like what happens to your lift bays or if you have a crane opening. Um, this is a job where basically uh, they didn't do anything at the crane opening. Uh, the rest of the job had uh, temporary protection applied but uh, the crane opening didn't. And you can see there's, uh, there's definitely water coming through where the crane opening was, uh, and they've missed uh, installing any protection above it. So the way we suggest uh, basically managing this is being as proactive as possible during pre-construction. Um, we often like to see uh, the, the project team put together what we call a moisture management plan to talk about how you're gonna do these things during construction. So, uh, Usually the more detail, the better, but basically, um, you know, what sort of uh, methods do you want to do to protect uh, your, your frame? You could pick that, that large tent that the one project had, um, or you could choose a, a moisture resistant product that's applied to the mass timber. Um, are you going to measure uh, how wet it gets during construction? Um, what do you want to do with your, your crane bays and your lift bays? Um, who's basically checking the weather forecast to see, okay, it's gonna rain 50 millimeters on Saturday and no one's gonna be on site. So usually the more, the more detail, the better. I also wanted to point out that it's, this all totally depends on where your project is, how tall is it, um, and there's different solutions for uh, different, different jobs, uh, not one size fits all. Um, we've tried to help with a little bit of guidance on this. So we've, um, they have a NLT guide and a CLT guide, which stands for nail laminated timber and cross laminated timber. Um, 
they've just given a little bit of guidance here on different solutions you could, you could consider um, to protect the timber structure. Uh, basically going for something that's, you know, very exposed for a long time where they're, they're installing like a fully adhered roofing membrane on the, the top solution. Um, to some of the lower solutions where um, the, the climate you're building in may not rain a lot. So um, you're, you're installing a membrane that is not fully adhered or rather just taping joints to, to keep water away from the vulnerable areas. Now I'm gonna move on to how you actually design your enclosure. For mass timber in particular, uh, this, this has a larger effect on how, um, how the moisture is controlled. And uh, the faster you can construct your building enclosure, um, the less it's gonna be exposed to wetting. So we usually, when we're looking at these types of buildings, uh, try to put an emphasis on getting the enclosure uh, at least watertight as quick as possible. Um, this is what you would normally see on uh, any steel or concrete job. You see you're basically building uh, things piece by piece. Someone is going up and installing membrane. Uh, someone is going back and putting in insulation, putting in cladding support. Um, this is a very slow process. Um, even though it's a nice day, if that, that job happened to be rained on, half of it would be covered, but the other half would be exposed to some wetting. And we generally like to look at this on like um, how tall your building is will affect sort of what your strategy is. So uh, if you have a very low and wide building, the roof becomes, getting the roof on as quick as possible becomes more critical. Uh, whereas if you have a tall slender building, uh, getting the walls installed uh, becomes more critical to prevent uh, overall wetting of the structure. So just some things that, that tend to, to slow down construction or are impractical for tall buildings. Um, so you can see stick framing on site, um, scaffolding, uh, and, and working from lifts. So uh, a zoom boom or a scissor lift. Obviously not practical for uh, like a 17 story building. So here's where we're kind of getting into to different options. Um, on your left, uh, kind of that first building we showed where you're, you're doing everything by hand, um, you have multiple trades going up there, installing multiple layers. Uh, whereas if you look at the two options on the right, you are looking at more of a pre-made uh, prefab panel that can be installed more quickly. Um, you're doing more work in a factory to get that ready ahead of time, but you can close in your walls much faster. So this is actually what we did for uh, UBC Tallwood. Uh, we had a company that basically um, pre-made panels. Um, they, they slotted together very similar to a curtain wall system, um, except it was made of opaque, it was an opaque wall. It had windows already installed in it. Um, you can see we kind of had a concept here, how big we'd make them, how we'd lift them into place and have them slot together. So this is the factory. My boss, who was uh, at the time, told me that this photo was taken um, basically the day that they got approval. So you don't have to uh, you don't have to build up your building. You can start building panels right away. Here's a photo of them lifting uh, one of those panels in. <coughs> And then I have a, a uh, video of this being built. So they built their timber structure and then uh, the walls are falling in behind. Um, timber is very fast to build, uh, mass timber. So you can see that the wall panels are kind of keeping pace like two or three floors below. And uh, minus the roof, they are basically watertight in uh, 60, 65 days. Before we move on, any questions on, on that? So the, the comment was basically um, looking at panels. There's a few options to do that. Like we, we pre-made our panels um, with a, a cladding system on the outside, but EAST is an option, um, although it hasn't been looked at uh, particularly, but precast might be another option as well. Um, basically anything that gets you a panel, a weather type panel very quickly and can be installed quickly. That was uh, the same project that I was showing before that had the, uh, the Toys R Us kiddie pools. 
<laughs> um, this, it's in Vancouver, so of course it got rained on when it was being built. Um, they ha their moisture protection plan was basically to pre-coat um, the, the mass timber members in the factory with, um, it was like a liquid applied membrane. Um, so they pre-coated everything that was a floor slab. And then once they got to site, uh, they had, they basically didn't have all the, the details worked out, but they did have that the, the general contractor was responsible for keeping bulk water off of the floor slabs. Um, so it was a combination of a, a coating, factory installed coating, um, as well as uh, due diligence and uh, manpower on site to try and keep it dry. It was a CLT panel, and my understanding is they don't, when they, they make a CLT panel, they aren't too picky about the particular type of wood. It's just usually uh, SPF. Yeah, that's right. Uh, CLT slabs and then glue lamp columns. So the question is, any experience with curtain wall application? So um, the system uh, we were showing on UBC Tall Wood is applied very similar to a, a curtain wall system, except it, the product wasn't curtain wall. Um, there are other projects now, and uh, we have the one of the ones I was showing earlier, the U of T one, um, does use areas of curtain wall. Um, that were very similar to the way you would unitize curtain wall a tall tower. The question was, um, does your, your selection of panel type, um, being CLT, NLT, there's a few more that have come up recently, like there's a mass plywood one, um, have on, on effect of wetting. Um, generally, there, there are some minute differences. CLT uh, is a little bit uh, better in the sense that it is like, there's an adhesive there, whereas uh, NLT is basically, um, you know, rough lumber nailed together with a piece of plywood on top. Um, it's very interesting that a, pretty much anyone could start an NLT factory, whereas there's two CLT factories in Canada right now, hopefully three soon. Um, they can all get wet. CLT is slightly um, more resistant to moisture just in the way it's built. I don't think there are um, any specific standards to it yet, probably because we just haven't built that many um, buildings like this. Um, from what I've talked to uh, other people in RDH, the, the best resources are those CLT guide and NLT guide. Um, and maybe some of the comments in there eventually make their way into a standard of how we, nor how we should do tall wood buildings. From what I've seen, it's been project specific rather than following a, a specific guideline. Right, so the question was about flooring types, and uh, when we selected our um, sealer on site, um, what, what happened to it once the building was done? Um, so I can tell you a lot of these wood buildings, they end up using um, raised access flooring. Um, so it basically would, uh, the one that I'm working on right now, uh, basically that, check, that coating check, check. is gonna live there forever and it's just gonna be underneath the raised access floor. Check, check, For check, the, check. Um, the UBC one check, check, I showed you, check. they were casting concrete check, check, on check, top. Check. Uh, so they're adding like a two inch topping and then that gave you your substrate for whatever flooring you wanted to do after. So we're gonna move on to monitoring, uh, kind of being the, the last major consideration we should think about versus regular dimensional lumber. Um, as we saw earlier, the wetting patterns of these like massive blocks of wood are a little more complicated. Um, so generally you find, you know, how long it's been exposed to moisture, when is it seeing the sun? What products have been applied that are going to help it dry or inhibit it from drying? Um, and as we kind of touched on earlier, if you have NLT, CLT, where are the the, point, the joints in the in the structure that are going to get let, let water deeper into it? One of the uh, probably most engineering uh, solutions we've seen is there's companies that will basically. Uh, 
fully sensor a, a CLT panel, so it'll give you different moisture contents, it will give you uh, different temperatures and RHs within the panel. Um, and the idea is that you probably have one every floor, one every two floors. And from the, the factory where this comes from to your construction site and end of the job, you can sort of see what, what each floor is doing. As you can see here, if you look at the edges of our NLT slabs here, um, you can see a bit of wetting. Uh, you can generally see if it's being exposed to, to moisture, but that first solution um, I showed you is probably uh, a bit of a more uh, proactive, more heads up way to, to know. But uh, when you walk around site, you can generally see if things are, are dry or wet. So on this particular job, we happen to get a, a colder and rainier Toronto winter than we were expecting. We started looking at how the inside of these panels were performing. So we basically built uh, moisture sensors and instead of, uh, if anyone's familiar with a moisture meter, it really only digs in uh, a quarter inch. So looking what was happening deeper within these panels, and uh, that is, that's me, I've installed a lot of sensors into uh, wood buildings so far. Um, on the left was the one for UBC uh, Tallwood. Basically, we, during a mock-up, same sort of idea, we put sensors deep into uh, the CLT slabs to figure out, okay, like, is it what's happening in the center of the panel versus the outside of the panel, and how does it dry? What happens if it rains? Um, where, where another, the one on the right is on site, same idea. And this is, uh, on the left, is the uh, UBC one all wired up. So, similar to uh, how I showed at the start, you're continuously monitoring to see what's happening during rainfall events, what happens when you, you put your concrete topping on top of the CLT, um, giving you a collection of data. Uh, I have a screenshot there, basically, to show you. Um, if you had an NLT panel, the the moisture content can vary quite significantly um, depending on how much moisture it's seeing at the top. Like you can see the, the plywood at the very top of the panel is quite wet, whereas um, the underside is drying out quite nicely. And there's also less scientific ways to figure this out. So uh, in addition to those sensors, we also wanted to know visually how it was doing. So uh, after, on a few locations, we, we cut holes through the, the topping just to see how, uh, how wet it was. All sort of options you could even include in a moisture management plan, like you might plan to have uh, those panels that continuously monitor, you might plan to make sensors, or you might even plan to do this every so often. So the question was, did we drill those holes dry? And yes, we did. We told them not to, uh, to wet. Because <laughs> obviously that is going to mess with whatever moisture content you, you get once you open up the, the opening. In the event that the moisture content is measured greater than the percentage that you want, and you're in a situation where you've just covered it, or you've enclosed your building, what do you do in that event to get rid of the moisture, short of undoing everything that you've just done? That's a great question. So uh, it, it is obviously project specific and your objective, um, especially with the two strategies I was showing you before, like I would way rather follow those two paths rather than get into a, a situation where you have to dry it out. Um, if you are stuck with that, there's a ton of variables in terms of, okay, how, um, how can we dry it out? How long do we have? What sort of temperatures are we playing with? Um, how has it been sealed in? That, that concrete topping and your flooring and all sorts of stuff like that will um, obviously minimize how much it can dry upwards. Um, it, it becomes a complicated question. <laughs> but generally, heat, air movement, controlling humidity within uh, getting enclosed and controlling your humidity are all like good steps to address that once you are have a wetter wood building. Uh, I also wanted to show this. So this is um, 
some buildings that didn't necessarily get too wet, but were dried out very quickly. Um, so if you dry out your wood structure very quickly, a lot of times you can see uh, checking cracks. Um, one of these was in a stairwell and you can see they've painted the two and then the gaps have pulled apart. Um, doesn't look the best. So that's why I'm kind of having the a message here being uh, that both tall wood structures require care and innovation. Um, and, and I'd add pre-planning as well. So just to recap some of the things we we're suggesting for that, having a moisture management plan, uh, having a fast enclosure, considering what we can do to monitor, and considering how wet we can get the wood and, and what happens if it gets wet, how do we dry that back out? That is all I have. So if there is uh, questions. Do you find any res resistance from these insurance companies to protect this type of buildings? I personally have not dealt with that a lot. I know it's, it is a conversation that is ongoing. And um, I also understand from others who are higher above me in RDH that, that they do like seeing um, moisture protection plans and basically um, understanding uh, how, how we can manage this during construction rather than going in blind. How flammable are these things for a builder's respirator? The question is how flammable are they? Um, not my area of expertise. I'm always interested to hear what uh, fire engineers have to say about this. Um, my understanding is that basically um, when a structural engineer will design the primary structure, they oversize the members. Um, if you're looking at some of those buildings, the column, the wood columns are quite large. Um, and the intent of that is that if it ever catches fire, uh, it might lose a certain percentage of that and that remain, it forms a char layer and that remaining section um, is more than sufficient to hold up the building. So um, I know it's an area that's actively being discussed, but uh, we're seeing more and more fire tests and more and more um, studies and, and answers to basically try and clarify that. Uh, currently in Ontario, there's a limit on the building height for wood structures. You showed uh, the beginning of Toronto having, I think it was 19 stories or something. How are they getting around that code limitation? So the question is, I showed a building, um, you know, on, Ontario has limitations for how tall we can build based on building code. Um, I showed a building at U of T that was basically 16 stories, um, which is above that. Um, the way they get, they usually get around this is um, if you're not following a prescriptive path in, uh, in the building code, you're basically relying on your, your structural engineer, your fire engineer to demonstrate um, through engineering practice that this can work. Um, it usually helps that uh, if you are a separate entity such as UBC or U of T, um, they can get these done and push harder to, to make that happen. Um, perhaps that's why we've seen the, like, the two tallest ones are built on campuses. Uh, but generally, if you show um, in your submission, if you show ways of managing that, you can get around the sort of prescriptive requirement. I was just going to add, there's a requirement for a detailed peer review anytime that you're going outside a prescriptive method for tall buildings like that. So there'd be two engineering companies is effectively checking each other's work. Yeah, we've definitely seen that on, on some jobs that they, they always have a peer review. Are there not uh, some proposed code changes to the National Building Code to allow 12 story to be done more easily under the standard code? So the question is, were there not um, changes to the N, proposed changes, sorry, to the NBC to allow 12 story? Um, we see because you know these buildings are springing up so rapidly and they're all um, not following a prescriptive path, they're all kind of doing their own solution. Um, there's certainly codes that are uh, basically allowing higher wood buildings to follow that prescriptive path more regularly. 
Um, I'm not totally familiar with what the proposed is for NBC, but uh, we're seeing that the certainly the the height limit that they're allowing is definitely going up in different municipalities. Um, I know, for instance, in Mon in uh, Quebec, they had um, one company that investigated doing a I want to say 15 story building. Um, so they kind of ironed out what what that building looked like um, and went through that whole peer review process. And then a couple of years later, they built almost the identical building. And because they had already gone through that process, um, it wasn't uh, the second building went through much cleaner um, and there was less time dealing with codes and code officials. You spend a lot of time wandering around installing probes and sensors in various locations. I'm just wondering if your findings or results, um, you were able to learn how to target your risk management practices to specific conditions or not. Is there, have your, did your findings or, um, sort of, I don't know, direct learning for the next project in some way? We've, so the question is like, um, based on the, the probes that I've installed on these various buildings, um, can these lessons be applied to future buildings? And yes, that's that's certainly um, what what we're trying to do. Um, you sort of learn uh, the ways, the methods they get wet, um, what sort of uh, things affect different areas. For instance, like the lift bay that I was showing earlier that got really wet. That's something we learned on one job that we'll be thinking about for the next job. Um, you also learn uh, how long it takes things to dry out. So uh, you s that profile that I showed you, you sort of get an appreciation of, um, you know, the bottom of the panel might dry out very rapidly, whereas the, the top or center of that panel can stay wet for quite a while. And when you get into situations with other jobs um, and you see it getting wet, you're like, okay, I know this is going to be like thing, something that could last several months rather than it's no problem. We can dry it out in a few weeks. So what is the rate of drying out of the bottom of the panel if the top is covered in, say, we can talk after. Um, <laughs> there's so many variables to that. Um, it's something we're working through, but there's it's very difficult uh, to, to give you a specific answer. Um, I can show you some other stuff after on drying. So the question where are, is where are the, the CLT plants in Canada? One is in Quebec, which is where projects in Ontario seem to be getting their CLT for right now. Um, another one is in uh, the interior of BC. So like Kelowna, Kamloops area, if you're familiar with that. Um, and then the third one is proposed to be very close to us. Uh, I'm not sure exactly, but it, it is in southern Ontario. Uh, I don't know if they have a specific location picked out yet, but the intent is that it, like, it will supply Toronto and the surrounding area. St. Thomas. Thomas is what I'm hearing from the crowd. Question is, how many NLT manufacturers there are? There, there is a lot more. Um, certainly more than I could uh, count or know specifically, like, the names of. Um, we've certainly dealt with a number of them, but I imagine there's kind of in the neighborhood of like 50. Uh, basically, if you have a factory, um, you could start an NLT factory because you only really need people to start uh, nailing boards together on end and someone to nail down plywood versus uh, the machinery and more complicated machines uh, and bending materials to actually do a CLT plant. A lot of CLT plants have um, a machine that does the adhesive as well as CLT cutters. So like very specialized equipment that's coming from Europe that makes it um, really prohibitive to, to just go out and start a CLT factory. Question is, how much do we look over to Europe for solutions? We certainly go back and forth um, and look at different ways they've managed it. The solution they like to use a lot is that that uh, basically tenting the entire building. Um, there was also another building uh, I'm thinking of, uh, I want to say in, in Sweden or Norway, where they, they panelized very similarly to... Uh, to uh, the UBC building. So we're certainly looking back and forth. Um, they use it a bit more and a lot of the products come from there, but I'd say um, 
we're looking there as well as what, what's going on in North America as well. They certainly have easier access to, to some of the products and uh, thanks.